it's one o'clock and, and I'm welcoming you to our 22nd Public Health Grand Rounds at CDC. I do want to mention, as always, for those of you who may be new to these events, that you can see us both internally through the CDC webpage or externally through the link here. And also, you can also watch us on YouTube. So uh, in my family, I'm now the most popular person on YouTube because my kids don't do anything fun that would get them to YouTube. <laughs> I would like to mention that um, we are, uh, just a couple of topics that are coming in July and August, electronic health records and newborn screening, and then that we are transitioning from a third Thursday, I know this is gonna come as a shock to a lot of people, to a third Tuesday in a month. Uh, we hope to be able to keep the same time slot, and, and I will make sure we share that information widely. And the first topic in the new time uh, day is going to be traumatic brain injury. Um, I must disappoint some of you who stop me in the elevator after each one of these sessions and say that, you know, a small part of the reason why they enjoy this session is how I make fun of the speakers and show them in all kinds of compromising positions. Uh, this time, I'm not going to do that. I thought that the topic itself is so serious that perhaps we could stay away from being too funny, at least I wanted to stay away from being too funny. We have four outstanding individuals in, in many ways with whom I have worked over the past several weeks um, very closely, and I'm sure there's going to be a withdrawal uh, symptoms here this weekend. Uh, we have two colleagues from CDC, Jim Mercy and Janet Saul, and then we have two colleagues from outside CDC, Shairi Turner, please learn how to pronounce her name, from Florida, and Patrick McCarthy from Annie E. Casey Foundation. One thing that I would like to leave you with is the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of children who endure maltreatment every year. And if each event was actually a single event, and you will hear from our speakers that it's not a single event, it's not something happens once as a rule, this would be the speed, the speed of these children's photos appearing on the screen is the rate with which a child maltreatment occurs in our country. There is 702,000 confirmed cases every year and that translates to 20,600 a day, 8.58 an hour, 14 a minute, and 4.3, and one in four, every 4.3 seconds. So I wanted you to really be shocked with those numbers, as I think some of us who don't work in this arena are shocked because we're so used to hearing about so many other things, but not necessarily about something that has to be close to everybody because everybody has a child in their family and you don't have to be a parent to appreciate that. And with that, I am going to um, ask our colleagues in the studio to put a short um, welcoming comment uh, by our director and then we will immediately begin with our presentations. Child abuse is a crime, a tragedy, and a significant public health problem. In this country, about one in five children have experienced some form of maltreatment, either physical, sexual, or other abuse. Child maltreatment results in more than 1,700 deaths each year, but the negative health effects of child maltreatment reach well beyond these fatalities. In addition to physical injuries, maltreatment interferes with brain development. Children who are maltreated are at greater risk for adult health problems such as alcoholism, smoking, depression, drug abuse, obesity, high-risk behaviors, suicide, and certain chronic diseases. This session of Public Health Grand Rounds will focus on the epidemiology and costs of child maltreatment and the recommended actions to both learn more and do more to combat this urgent and tragic public health issue. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Jim Mercy, and I'm going to begin by providing an overview of the nature, consequences, and societal burden of child maltreatment. 
You know, child maltreatment was one of the initial issues spurring CDC's interest in violence prevention just over 30 years ago. In fact, one of CDC's first violence investigations was a study of a series of 22 child murders that occurred in Atlanta between 1979 and 1981. CDC's work on child maltreatment prevention has expanded since the early 1980s, especially with congressional appropriations over the past decade. Our annual appropriation for child maltreatment was just under $7 million in fiscal year 2011. But the importance of child maltreatment as a public health problem has become clearer as the full consequences and costs have come to light over these past three decades. Let's begin by defining child maltreatment. Child maltreatment can either be an act of commission or omission by any type of caregiver to a person under the age of 18. There are four types of child maltreatment. Physical abuse, such as hitting, kicking, shaking, or burning. Sexual abuse that includes behavior such as rape or fondling. Psychological abuse, such as terrorizing or intimidating a child. And neglect, which is the failure to meet a child's basic needs for things like nutrition, shelter, and medical care. It is beyond tragic that almost 1,800 children died from mal maltreatment at the hands of their parents or caregivers in 2009. This is the equivalent of five children dying every day or 71 classrooms of children a year. The great majority of these children were under age four and abuse of head trauma from being shaken is the most important cause of these deaths. Even more tragically, these deaths represent only the tip of the iceberg. In 2009, state child protective service agencies received about six million reports of alleged maltreatment of children. Based on investigations, these reports confirmed 702,000 cases of child maltreatment. These confirmed cases of child maltreatment, however, represent only a fraction of the true magnitude of the problem because most cases are never reported. Survey data provide a more complete picture of this problem. Based on self-reports from children and parents in a nationally representative survey in 2008, about one in 10 or 7.5 million children were estimated to have been maltreated in the past year, and one in five at some point in their childhood. Self-report data indicates that the overall risk for maltreatment increases with age, with emotional abuse being the most common form, followed by physical abuse, then neglect and sexual abuse. Very young children, however, are at greatest risk of most severe injuries and death from maltreatment. We also know that children with special needs, such as those with learning, mental, or physical disabilities, are at increased risk of maltreatment. Child Protective Service data is the primary source of data for monitoring child maltreatment in the U.S. While this data source is very valuable for monitoring the activities of the child welfare system, it is well recognized that it underestimates the magnitude of child maltreatment and distorts its epidemiology. For example, child protective survey data suggests that young children are at greatest risk of child maltreatment. But self-report data indicates that risk is greatest among adolescents. New methods are needed that are less affected by the likelihood of cases coming to the attention of authorities. Surveys of children and parents is one very promising method as well as making better use of hospital discharge and emergency department data. Those who maltreat children, that is perpetrators, are influenced by a variety of individual, family, and community characteristics, largely related to social and economic disadvantage. Individual characteristics associated with perpetration include factors that may impair judgment, place caregivers under stress, or those associated with limited parent no parenting knowledge and skills. Family factors include those that produce stress or isolation from support. Community factors are generally features of neighborhoods that undermine safety, stability, support, and even trust. Child maltreatment influences health across the lifespan. Maltreatment and other adverse exposures contribute to social and emotional and cognitive impairments that in turn may lead to health risk behaviors and then disease, injury, and disability. These series of consequences suggest that maltreatment early in life may trigger, a, may trigger a sequence of events leading to premature mortality. 
The health consequences of child maltreatment are broad and varied, ranging from risk behaviors such as smoking to leading causes of death such as heart disease. The evidence of these associations is based on a huge literature that spans decades. The bottom line is that while the contribution of child maltreatment to any one of these health conditions may be relatively small, the cumulative impact of child maltreatment on health across these varied outcomes may be huge. The most prominent study documenting the relationship between child maltreatment and other early adverse exposures to health is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. This study was conducted by CDC and Kaiser Permanente in San Diego and began in the mid-1990s. This is a study of over 17,000 participants in which adult members of this HMO self-report their adverse childhood experiences and health status. Adverse experiences include physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, as well as risk factors for maltreatment, such as substance abuse and mental illness. In this study, an ACE score is created by summing the number of experiences, exposures to different types of adverse experiences that occurred to a respondent as a child. Here is an example of the relation between the ACE score and mental health, in this case, lifetime depression. What we see is a graded relationship between the odds of experiencing depression and the number of, of adverse experiences. Those respondents who experienced five or more ACEs were at five times the risk of suffering from depression as those who had no ACEs. This association is especially important given that 9% of the adult population is estimated to be currently depressed. It's not just mental health that is, that is affected, but also physical health. The odds of experiencing cardiovascular disease increases with the number of adverse experiences as well, even after adjusting for traditional risk factors. These trends also appear for di diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and cancer. Even risks for infectious disease, in this case HIV, are affected by child maltreatment. Again, what we see is a consistent graded relationship with increasing number of adverse experiences being associated with the greater odds of IV drug use, sexual promiscuity, and having an STD. What mechanism could explain this relationship between child maltreatment and such a broad range of health, out health outcomes? An ever-expanding scientific literature shows that the architecture of the brain is actually changed by the impact of excessive and repeated stress. This stress causes the release of chemicals that impair normal cell growth and alter basic structures in the brain, making child maltreatment victims more vulnerable to health problems across the lifespan. CDC has recently estimated the economic toll of child maltreatment. The total lifetime economic burden resulting from new cases of fatal and non-fatal child maltreatment in the U.S. in 2008 is estimated to exceed $121 billion. About 20% 20, 20 of this estimate is attributable to health care costs, 69% to productivity losses, and the rest to the cost of child welfare, criminal justice, and special education. This cost estimate is based on confirmed reports of child maltreatment to child protective service agencies. This is our most conservative estimate of the magnitude of child maltreatment. If one uses self-report data on the magnitude of child maltreatment, these costs balloon to over half a trillion dollars. Productivity losses and annual earnings are greater for child maltreatment than for smoking, obesity, and teen pregnancy combined. This isn't surprising given the broad impact of child maltreatment on mental and physical health as well as cognitive development. We face several significant challenges in reducing child maltreatment. For one, the significance of child maltreatment's impact on health is underappreciated. We also lack ongoing data, an ongoing data system for monitoring the full spectrum of child maltreatment. As a society, we have not prioritized primary prevention, but rather have invested primarily in response to the child welfare system. Finally, public health is not well integrated into a coordinated prevention system for child maltreatment. CDC is committed to reducing child maltreatment by moving the field towards evidence-driven prevention strategies in several key ways. First, by raising the visibility of the consequences and costs of child maltreatment. Second, by developing data systems to better track the problem. Third, 
by helping the field move towards policies and programs that impact the broad environment in which child maltreatment occurs. We need interventions that can be effectively scaled up and can have population impact at a, at a reasonable cost. Finally, we must mobilize the public health system to take leadership on this issue and fully engage in child maltreatment prevention. The following speakers will address many of these priorities, particularly as they relate to prevention policy, policies and public health capacity. Child maltreatment is at once a critical social and public health issue. Anything that undermines the healthy development of children, as does maltreatment, has profound implications for society. Public health must join child welfare, criminal justice, education, and other sectors to work together to ensure that every child has a healthy start in life. Our next speaker is Janet Saul. Good afternoon. Given Jim's comments on the prevalence and consequences of child maltreatment, it's easy to feel overwhelmed, but we believe there is hope through prevention. Let's start with what we're currently doing to stop the tragedy of child maltreatment. You just heard from Jim that one of our challenges is that we haven't prioritized prevention. Here's a picture of that challenge. It's not that we're ignoring the problem. There are many organizations whose work revolves around the issue of child maltreatment. But the majority of resources go to responding to child maltreatment after it has already occurred. Clearly, this response is critical. And in the federal arena, other agencies have this mandate. Most of the response efforts are housed in the Administration for Children and Families Office of Child Abuse and Neglect. And several federal agencies also work on child maltreatment prevention, including CDC. We focus our efforts on the bottom two sections of this triangle, that is, preventing child maltreatment before it occurs. We need a more balanced approach to addressing child maltreatment, an approach where we put at least, as, at least as much emphasis on prevention as on response. CDC's vision for preventing child maltreatment is to ensure that all children grow up with safe, stable, and nurturing relationships in their lives. or We call them SSNRs for short. We're not just talking about parents when we talk about SSNRs. We're also talking about other caregivers and important adults in a child's life. And we also focus on environments that are conducive to providing SSNRs. Because if a family lives in a chaotic, high-stress environment, it's much more difficult for parents to provide SSNRs. A focus on SSNRs is based on scientific evidence. The literature tells us that healthy development depends on the quality and reliability of children's relationships. Positive interactions build healthy brain architecture, and that also provides a strong foundation for learning, positive behavior, and health. How do we go about building SSNRs and preventing child maltreatment? In child maltreatment prevention, we're actually fortunate to have evidence that some prevention strategies do work, and I'm going to give some examples of those. One general type of strategy is called home visitation, in which trained practitioners, those could be nurses or parent educators, visit parents in their homes to provide information, training, and support on a variety of topics, including child development, child care, and parenting skills. The community guide recommends home visitation for preventing child maltreatment, but it also found that not all home visitation models are equally effective. The Affordable Care Act created the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visitation Program. This program is led by HRSA in collaboration with ACF and other federal agencies, including CDC. Funding is provided to states, territories, and tribes to implement evidence-based home visitation models. The governor of each state appoints a lead agency, and in over 30 states, the agency is in the public health department. Because this program is in the initial stages, we actually don't know yet how many families across the nation will benefit. However, this funding is a major milestone for prevention in that it is a national program and it will result in nationwide implementation of strategies that have the potential to prevent child maltreatment. One specific home visitation model is called Nurse Family Partnership, or NFP. 
Um, and in this program, registered nurses make home visits to first-time moms and their babies. This program has been rigorously evaluated multiple times. In one study, families exposed to NFP had 46% fewer cases of child maltreatment than families that did not get the program. Importantly, this home visitation model is also cost beneficial, providing around $6 in benefits for every dollar spent. Another evidence-based program is called the Positive Parenting Program, or Triple P. It was developed in Australia by a clinical psychologist who, after spending years working with families in crisis, decided that he wanted to prevent families from needing to seek therapeutic services. Triple P is made up of a collection of interventions. As you can see from this graphic, the frequency and intensity of what gets delivered depends on the needs of the family. So in the outermost ring, everyone gets the media messages, but in the center, only families in crisis get the intensive one-on-one -on -one counseling. Ideally, everyone in a community has access to some level of Triple P. Triple P has also been rigorously evaluated for many outcomes. A CDC-funded multi-county trial in South Carolina was the first study of Triple P to measure impact on child maltreatment. Our study provided evidence that Triple P can impact child maltreatment, estimating that for every 100,000 children in a community, we can prevent approximately 306 cases of child maltreatment, 188 out-of-home placements, and 60 injuries seen in hospitals, either through ER visits or hospitalizations. Triple P is available to any community that wishes to implement it. Communities purchase program materials and training for professionals from Triple P America. Through a partnership with the Doris Duke Foundation, CDC Foundation, and HRSA, CDC is currently funding two demonstration sites in Michigan and North Carolina to implement Triple P through local public health agencies and community health centers. The cost of Triple P is estimated to be just under $13 per child within the community, and Triple P is also cost beneficial, providing approximately $47 in benefits for every dollar spent. Another area in child maltreatment where we have an evidence-based program is abusive head trauma prevention. Abusive head trauma prevention programs give parents of newborns information about the serious adverse effects of shaking and offer guidance on how to handle a crying, crying infant to avoid shaking. One such program was developed and evaluated in New York by a pediatric neurosurgeon who dealt with the travesty, travesty of abusive head trauma after the fact. The program was delivered in hospital maternity wards before patients and their babies were discharged. This evaluation showed a 47% reduction in abusive head trauma cases. These findings have influenced 14 states to pass legislation mandating some form of abusive head trauma prevention. Currently, CDC is funding two statewide demonstrations of abusive head trauma prevention. Our goal is to evaluate them for their impact on abusive head trauma and to determine if there is a cost benefit. The first is in an expansion of the program tested in New York and the second is an evaluation in North Carolina of the period of purple crying, a program developed by the National Center on Shaken Baby Syndrome. Jim mentioned the need to strengthen national and state level prevention systems. We are doing just that with our public health leadership initiative. Its purpose is to strengthen public health capacity to lead child maltreatment prevention in states. Why this focus on public health agencies? First and foremost, as you have heard today, child maltreatment is a public health problem. Also, public health ha has a long history of working on complex problems that are not solvable by any one discipline, knowledge base, or value system. We have assessed the current public health role at the state level and found a greater degree of engagement than we had expected, but it's still not where it needs to be. Dr. Turner will provide an in-depth look at what Florida is doing. Even though the evidence we have isn't perfect, we need to act on it. We have effective individual and family-based programs. We need to simultaneously fill in the gaps in our knowledge. 
it's especially important that we understand how to change community and societal factors that contribute to putting parents and families at risk. Dr. McCarthy will focus his comments on policies that have the potential to prevent child maltreatment. Conducting policy evaluations would be a smart investment for our field at this time. Public health is a good delivery system for acting on what we know and standing at the ready to incorporate any new discoveries. Only through this type of coordinated, interactive system will we reach our goals of improving the lives of children by ensuring that they all have safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and by stopping child maltreatment. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Shairi Turner, the Deputy Secretary for Health and the Director of the Office of Minority Health in the Florida Department of Health. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss Florida's effort in the area of child maltreatment prevention. I will present some specific data on Florida's current child maltreatment burden and some data about longer term consequences, similar to what you heard from Jim at the national level. Then I will provide some context for how child maltreatment prevention and child protection is addressed in Florida, followed by more detailed information on the role of public health in preventing child maltreatment. Florida has over 4 million children. There were over 45,000 confirmed cases of child maltreatment in 2009. The majority of confirmed cases, 53%, or neglect, thank you, sorry, with about 11% confirmed for physical abuse and about 5% confirmed as sexual abuse. Florida rates of 11.3 per 1,000 cases are similar to the national average of 9.3 per 1,000. As for the nation, our numbers are likely just the tip of the iceberg. Certain types of maltreatment are less likely to be reported, and other cases are more challenging to validate. But even with limited data, this results in a significant societal and public health problem for the state. Because it is very important to have good data, in 2008, Florida added a subset of questions mirroring the adverse childhood experiences study to the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Jim already explained what ACEs are, so here is just a reminder. Among the 8,821 respondents in Florida, only 13% had zero ACE risk factors, and 28.1% had four or more. This group reported two to three times more physical, mental health, and social concerns than those with zero to two ACE factors. At the state level, the economic burden of child maltreatment is large. The estimated cost to Florida is over $9 billion per year. To put that in perspective, the Florida legislature just passed a $67 billion budget. This then represents over 13% of the entire state budget. Now that you have a glimpse of the burden of child maltreatment in Florida, let's explore what child maltreatment prevention efforts occur in Florida. As elsewhere, traditionally the focus in Florida has been on responding to reported cases of child abuse and neglect, with the majority of resources allocated to focusing on the children in the top of that triangle that Janet mentioned. In Florida, the lead agency responsible for investigation of child maltreatment is the Department of Children and Families. They also handle child welfare, mental health, and substance abuse, just to name a few services. They are ultimately responsible for the disposition of the child in a reported abuse case. The Department of Health has a leadership role in providing several kinds of prevention services to families to deter child maltreatment from occurring in the first place. And I will speak more about this later in this talk. 
Public health has had a growing role in preventing child maltreatment in Florida, starting with the passing of the Florida Prevention Plan focused on improving the status of young children. In 2007, legislation mandated clearly public health's role in child maltreatment and so codified the Department of Health's official role in child maltreatment prevention and helped to make this work sustainable. The Governor's Office of Adoption and Child Protection was established, as well as the Children and Youth Cabinet. The list of members on this cabinet shown here is impressive. Also, a new Child Abuse Prevention and Permanency Advisory Council was convened, chaired by the state's new Chief Child Advocate, and charged with the development of Florida's 18-month statewide plan on prevention and permanency. While a number of pieces were in place for some time, the changes in 2007 have led to more systemic and integrated thinking about the prevention system. The vision for the plan was that children are raised in healthy, safe, stable, and nurturing families. You are right. This is very similar to the SSNRs that you heard about from Janet. The plan highlights a number of important prevention strategies, such as infusing protective factors into systems that serve both parents and children, and providing information on ways to ensure children are safe and nurtured and live in stable environments that promote well-being. For example, in a tri-county area, Clay, Duval, and Nassau counties, the local community-based care lead agency for child welfare, a public-private partnership, has hired a nurse to work with their families, including helping them build the five protective factors. Statewide, our Medicaid Child Health Checkup Program is incorporating into their literature and outreach efforts that go to pediatricians, nurses, and families information about the five protective factors, their importance, and how to build them. Please note that monitoring and evaluation of the plan implementation are also included. Here are just some of key Florida activities that create a network for the prevention of child maltreatment. Let me point out a few. The Healthy Start program has an, an assessment tool called Tell Us About Yourself that incorporates personal and family history and has recently incorporated components of the ACE scoring tool. It is used to help focus interventions in the prenatal and early childhood periods. The Teen Parent Program, Florida Parent Helpline, and the Florida Circle of Parents provide parent-to-parent -parent support while Speak Up, Be Safe is an elementary school child abuse prevention curriculum being introduced into Florida schools. The child protection teams within the Department of Health play an important role in conjunction with the Department of Children and Families. They are medically directed, multidisciplinary, community-based programs that examine cases of potential child abuse or neglect and provide various assessment services listed on this slide. They supplement the child protective investigations of the Department of Children and Families or the designated sheriff's offices. Experts in the field include specially trained pediatricians, nurses, clinical case coordinators, psychologists, and attorneys. The healthcare services providers are especially trained and qualified to notice the smallest physical or behavioral changes in a child, which can lead to early detection and reporting potential abuse cases. In Florida, over 250,000 reports of possible child maltreatment are made annually to the Florida Child Abuse Hotline. In 2009, these teams reviewed over 190,000 reports and then provided services to 29,000 children. 16,000 were found to have experienced child maltreatment. Another critical component to child maltreatment prevention is the Child Abuse Death Review Committee established in 1999 as an independent entity administratively housed within the Department of Health. It reviews the facts and circumstances of all deaths of children from birth through age 18, which occur as a result of verified child abuse or neglect. 
The purpose of the review is to identify deficiencies or problems in the services provided to these children and their families by public and private agencies. The findings and recommendations are used to aid in future prevention efforts by informing changes in legislation or policies and helping to develop practice standards that support healthy children and reduce preventable child abuse deaths. The staff includes those from the Department of Health and seven other state agencies, as well as 11 members appointed by the State Surgeon General. In 2009, there were 197 reviews, which comprised only 7% of all child deaths in Florida, and they were predominantly young males. Although this is the last step in addressing child maltreatment, and some would say that these are the children that the system has failed, much information can be gathered that will potentially save the lives of other children. In conclusion, Florida continues to make strides in our child maltreatment prevention efforts by having a state statute and infrastructure in place to support public health participation, particularly around prevention approaches. This allows for the work to be sustainable and provides clarity on the role of each agency. For, Depart for the Department of Health, being at the table at the strategic planning stage is important in order to be fully engaged and part of the long-term solutions. This ensures that prevention approaches are prioritized rather than relying solely on response in emergent situations. Public health brings a great deal to the table, primarily by looking at the issue through a broader framework and providing opportunities to interact with families in a non-threatening manner. Also importantly, public health can serve to, con to convene this multi-sector approach by bringing other diverse partners and stakeholders together. Thank you. Our final speaker now is P Dr. Patrick McCarthy. Good afternoon, I'm Patrick McCarthy. I'm the President and CEO of the Annie E. Casey Foundation and I'm gonna be describing some of the policy options for reducing child maltreatment, focusing especially on the factors that contribute to risk poverty, family dysfunction, and the breakdown of community norms uh, and, and supports. Uh, the Casey Foundation's mission is to foster public policies, human service reforms, and community supports that effectively meet the needs of today's vulnerable kids and families. We advocate for policies that can support the scaling up of evidence-based programs such as the kind that uh, Janet walked us through that build stronger families. Policy approaches have limits. Compared to some of the programs we heard about, for example, uh, there are no single or even multiple child maltreatment prevention policies with strong evidence of success. But if you're a policymaker and you want to reduce the risk of child maltreatment, the evidence suggests that you would enact policies that, number one, reduce poverty, number two, reduce the concentration of poverty in certain places, increase effective family strengthening interventions, and promote positive parenting norms. Now, I'm going to focus primarily on the poverty issues and the scaling up of evidence-based uh, prevention uh, activities. Reducing poverty, uh, the, the, the data suggests that to reduce poverty, there are three things that a young person needs to do. Number one, complete high school. Number two, delay parenthood. And number three, achieve an early attachment to the workforce. National and state policy can help with all three of these. On the education front, federal and state policy can help reduce poverty by investing in high quality early learning and literacy, as well as providing for opportunities for youth who need to find a way back to the educational opportunities if they've gone off track. In the area of delaying parenthood, policies can promote community-based uh, pregnancy prevention, and in early workforce attachment, policy, of course, can provide support for summer jobs and supported work opportunities for young people. However, in investing in the parents of that young person is also critical. This requires policies that ensure that work pays well enough to lift the family out of policy, if necessary, supplemented by additional income supports like the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit. Policies can also make it possible for parents to work. There's making work pay and there's making work work. 
In order for parents to be able to work, they need health coverage, child care, paid leave, and adequate unemployment benefits when we hit the kind of recession that we're in the midst of right now. In the area of building and protecting assets, policies can also help families develop and protect assets that can secure their economic success, such as individual development accounts that match savings, financial coaching, and restriction of practices that strip wealth from poor families and communities. For example, home ownership can be an effective means to build wealth. While the net worth of a typical low-income household is about $7,900, Low-income households that own a home have incomes six times that, $50,000. Big question, though, can we actually reduce poverty? Well, there's some evidence that we can. If you look at the stimulus bill, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we see that that mitigated the effects of the recession on children by temporarily expanding supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits, SNAP, or the food stamp program creating a temporary tax credit for working families, the Making Work Pay Credit, and expanding the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit. These cash and near-cash benefits helped families meet their children's most basic needs at home while pumping money into the economy. It's projected that 6,100,000 families were lifted out of poverty in the 36 states and District of Columbia for which we have data, and that overall, the impact of the recession on poor folks reached a total of almost 33 million families. An example from overseas, the, poverty, uh, the child poverty rate in Great Britain has been cut in half since 1994 using some of the same basic policy tools that we have available to us but haven't fully used. By contrast, the U.S. child poverty rate has trended upward since the year 2000 and children have proved economically vulnerable to increased unemployment. Some of the kinds of policies in Great Britain that led to these kinds of extraordinary results were increases in the national minimum wage uh, in comparable dollars, it's about $9.70, $9.70 in Britain, about $7.25 in the U.S. Tax incentives to encourage single parents to move into paid employment, increased public benefits for parents, universal preschool and regulations making it easier for parents of young children to request flexible work schedules. Again, poverty is one of many factors that increase the risk of child maltreatment, yet it appears to be the single largest risk factor. Let's be clear, most poor folks don't abuse their kids. However, being in poverty greatly increases your risk. But we also have to respond more effectively to allegations of child maltreatment when they, when they hit our public child welfare systems. Federal policy can increase our national investment in research and evaluation of the kinds of promising interventions uh, that Janet talked about, making sure those interventions are delivered with fidelity and at scale. We have a number of promising areas that we ought to be investing in, including providing universal contact and screening at birth, at age three, at school entry, and at the third, sixth, ninth, and eleventh grade, and by investing in evidence-based prevention programs as described earlier. Just one community uh, level example. Sorry. Just one community level example um, from, oops, can I go back here? Um, studies strongly indicate that children who attended Chicago's Child Parent Center preschool programs in the highest poverty neighborhoods experienced substantially lower rates of child maltreatment by the age of 17. For every dollar invested in the preschool programs, the return to society at large was $7.14 in reduced costs of things like remedial education, justice system expenditures, etc. States need to make these kinds of commitments to implement and scale up evidence-based prevention early intervention and treatment tied to cost-benefit analysis. This requires changes in how programs are financed, how states ensure fidelity to these proven practices, workforce changes, contracting changes, and community engagement. Another critical policy element is how systems respond to allegations. For example, differential response systems focus on the, which focus on the well-being of the whole family are grounded in the premise that a one-size response to child maltreatment events simply doesn't work. At present, over 30 child welfare jurisdictions have completely or partially integrated differential response into their systems. Depending on how a state implements the approach, research indicates reductions in child maltreatment ranging from 20% to almost 
We also must shift funds from ineffective deep end programs to prevention and early intervention. For example, the Casey Foundation has worked with New York's Administration for Children's Services on the goal of decommissioning 600 congregate care beds. These are very expensive deep end beds. This goal was surpassed with the number of congregate care beds being reduced from a high of 4,174 in 2002 down to 2,192 in 2008, a 47% decrease. The important of this is that yields a saving of $41 million, a portion of which was then reinvested in supportive and aftercare services. Policies that reduce poverty, that deconcentrate poverty, and attempt to change norms would all contribute to a decrease in child maltreatment. More direct responses to child maltreatment require scaling up of programs with best evidence. But our response to child maltreatment requires a commitment at the national, state, and local level all have a role to play. Our challenge is to build on the most promising examples and to persuade policymakers that these examples can be the norm rather than the exception. Given the cost of failure, the human consequences, and the investments that we will ultimately make if we choose to ignore this issue, the choice ought to be simple. Sound policy, approach, sound policy approaches that reduce poverty and scale up prevention and early intervention. In sum, my fellow panelists have shared the startling statistics and discussed the long-term consequences of child maltreatment in today's presentation. As startling as these may be, we all must work together knowing that child maltreatment can be prevented through the promotion of safe, stable, and nurturing relations, relationships and evidence-based initiatives that address the broader community versus just looking at individual change. As a nation, we have the opportunity to invest in proven policy and other interventions that can make our communities and our children safer, healthier, and more able to contribute to our future strength. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, we now have about uh, a little over 10 minutes for questions. Um, the floor is now open for questions. Um, we ask that you state your name and limit yourself to one question. While we're waiting for people to come to the microphone, um, let me ask uh, Dr. McCarthy uh, a question. You know, I was really interested in the Great Britain example of cutting the chi child poverty rate in half. What can we learn from other countries about policies that have the potential to prevent child maltreatment through addressing poverty and other issues? Yeah, I think there are a lot of really interesting things going on uh, right now, especially in the poverty area and the housing area uh, overseas. But also with this question that, that uh, Janet and Shigiri were, were talking about, which is how do you take these evidence-based interventions to a scale that's large enough that you don't just have program-level effects but actually whole population effects? And for example, again, in the United Kingdom, there's uh, an approach where they're trying to identify neighborhoods that have particularly high concentration of poverty and saturate those neighborhoods with evidence-based prevention programs on a range. And they're borrowing a lot from the U.S. So the irony here is that we're developing the programs, we're getting them replicated, and we're getting evidence behind them at the program level, but we haven't really mastered the public will to take these to a scale large enough that you see changes at the population level. In the UK, they're saying, well, we'll take a lot of your good ideas, and we're going to figure out how we scale them up so we actually move the entire needle. They did that with the poverty issue, and now they're starting to do it with things like child maltreatment. Please. Hi. Uh, thank you for a very good presentation. I'm Anna Kroger. I just have a question about one of the early slides that you showed um, about um, brain damage between children who are subject to maltreatment. I guess I was interested a little bit more in what we know about the brain damage. Um, if it's permanent brain damage, does it, um, similar to sort of if you, you know, stop smoking certain, you know, you can kind of restore some of the damage that's been done. What do we know about child maltreatment, brain damage, and, and over time? Mm -hmm. um, well, there is, there is evidence, I think, that, that the changes aren't necessarily permanent. I mean, one of the, one of the key, key ways that the brain is affected is by potentially affecting the stress regulation system. And you can think of the stress regulation system as a thermostat in your home at, that has a normal set point. And if you're exposed to repeated and excessive stress, that set point may be altered 
such that it's perhaps much lower. And in a house where you turn the thermostat down, your heaters come into, um, come, in, c come on much more frequently. And in the same way, those heaters will burn out faster if your stress regulatory system is activated more frequently. So um, it's also important to note that, that the brain is, is vulnerable to these types of stresses through, um, some people say, early adulthood, that different parts of the brains are affected, but you can still be affected by this excessive and repeated stress as an adolescent. So those are two uh, aspects of the effect on the brain that are important to remember. Hi, my name is Allison Amoroso. I was wondering if you could, maybe different panelists could speak about efforts to promote the earned income tax credit, for instance, here in Georgia, where one of the group of states that don't have one, maybe at a health department level, at a CDC level, and I know the NBKC Foundation has been doing a little bit of work, or maybe a lot of work, I don't know, but I'd be interested in seeing how um, that particular strategy could, could influence the child, child abuse problem. So if the question how is how do you build a campaign within a state in order to get a state level in earned income tax credit, of course there's a national earned income tax credit. Um, right, because if, I'm, cause if I, I've seen sure. the data that the states that don't have that have higher rates of poverty. Ab right. Absolutely. You know, we, we, we made a big bet in the mid-90s, and what we said was that if you're going to find a path out of poverty, it's not going to be through the transfer of public benefits alone. There's got to be a path towards work, and it was a, it was a deal. You know, if you work full time, you ought not be poor. In today's economy, if you don't have higher levels of education, you're going to have to have that income supplemented in some way. And going back to Ronald Reagan, by the way, who was a huge supporter of the ITC, uh, we've tried to supplement incomes at the national level. What states have started to figure out is that they want to deal with poverty at the state level. In a fairly straightforward way, they can give a percentage of that EITC on top of it and thereby incentivize work more uh, effectively. The challenge in this particular moment in time, of course, is that we're fighting a lot of battles to preserve state-level EITCs across the country because of the deficits that states are facing. This is the worst deficit situation for states since the Depression by far, no comparison to other, other recessions. So this is probably the time, not the time to mount a major campaign around EITCs, but rather to prepare in Georgia, but rather to prepare the ground so people start to see it not as a giveaway, but rather a path towards opportunity and incentive towards work, which we have, again, made the bet that that's the, the best path out of, out, out of poverty. It's also a matter, just tactical, it's just a matter of a lot of coalitions. You know, you need to have business at the table, you need to have the advocacy community united. There are, you know, one of the most effective approaches we've used is uh, using one of the grantees from Brookings. They do a geographic analysis and look at congressional districts and state senate districts and assembly districts and say, in your district, if you had an e EITC and a greater use of the federal EITC, more folks signing up for it, this is the amount of money that would come into your district. That's real economic investment. So, you know, pragmatically, that's, that's an argument that works a lot better than, gee, lift this poor family out of poverty. What works a lot better is say, this is actually good for your economy. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that's been our experience. Next questioner. Hi, Susan Katz. Thank you for your great work. Um, I have a question about the cost benefit figures that were mentioned. I was wondering if you had more information here about how they were calculated. In particular, I'm wondering if sometimes the benefit is not to the same group or the part of government that uh, pays the cost, and, and how do you handle that policy-wise? Can you hear me? Is it on? Okay. The second part? Where you said sometimes the benefit may not be to the same group that ha shows the cost savings or vice versa? Well, what I'm going to say is I wish that our health ec economist who calculated those was here right now. But I do know that um, the, the, um, one of the things that they did, the, um, 
the cost to society number that Jim presented, the $121 billion, um, that was derived by looking at costs, um, long-term costs due to child maltreatment like mental health and um, delinquency, getting involved in the juvenile justice system, um, um, education, not graduating from high school. Um, as well as short-term costs like cost of the child welfare system, any kind of involvement with medical services because of the child maltreatment. So I know that one of the things that they did is that they took the um, they took those costs um, of child maltreatment and then the cost of the program, and then they they looked at how much cost um, I'm sorry how much child maltreatment was prevented. So those are the factors that they used in getting it. And actually, um, Xiaoming Fang is in the audience who maybe afterwards he could explain that to you a little bit more because he's one of the health economists who, who helped to derive not just the national cost but also those cost benefit numbers. Do you have any more? Do you? No, I think that's accurate. And, but, but as you can see from our presentations, the cost of child maltreatment spread across society. So, and I think that the estimates that were derived um, that were, were factored into the uh, cost benefit analyses reflect a broad range of costs to a variety of sectors of society. Grant. Oh, there's someone over here. Who's oh, I'm it. sorry. Hi, uh, my name's Marion McDonald. Thank you for your presentations. One of the things that most of you alluded to is the epidemic nature of childhood sexual abuse and yet um, there weren't a lot of specifics talked about in terms of the interventions. And I'm wondering you know, if you could say something about that, especially since oftentimes a response to child abuse will, uh, child sexual abuse will simply put uh, the child in a situation where they have new uh, potential abusers. And I'm wondering if something like adding uh, child sexual abuse awareness to uh, what the person learns while they're learning not to shake the baby um, might be a good idea. I welcome your thoughts. There is a lot that people do across the country around child sexual abuse prevention. Um, many of the efforts are personal safety programs in schools. Uh, those have been evaluated to a certain extent. They've been evaluated to look at um, whether children heard the message, whether they understood it, whether they um, whether they disclosed child sexual abuse after hearing about the, you know, what to do if someone approaches you. There haven't been any that have looked at whether or not being exposed to a program like that actually prevents child sexual abuse from occurring. So we don't really know the effectiveness of that for the ultimate outcome. Um, so whether or not that could be added to um, something like abusive head trauma prevention, um, I, I think that, um, you know, act I mean, that's an interesting idea. Um, one of the things that we're currently doing right now that I'll mention is working with um, Dr. Kim Miller, who works in the Global AIDS Program and has developed a great parenting program called Parents Matter Here and Families Matter that's going into some other countries internationally. And what we're doing there is um, think is trying to add a module on child sexual abuse prevention to a parenting program but that it's just in the that's in the development stages but that's another place where I think specific information and conversation around child sexual abuse could be um, plugged into parent parenting programs Thank you. last question grant yeah grant Baldwin Injury Center uh, my question is for Dr. Turner. I wonder if you could speak to how you got the governor's commitment to child maltreatment prevention and the uh, specifically referencing the public health role, because I think that's a real model that I think other states need to adapt. Thank you. Um, there had been many years in the making of working behind the scenes on the part of staff at the Department of Health and the Department of Children and Families. Um, with the previous administration, the Governor Christ, uh, there were those within his administration who were supportive. So it was the stars aligning, I think, at that time where the legislation was ready, the interest was there. Uh, you had agency heads who he had appointed who were willing to take on the charge and move forward with it. So it was um, 
people who are waiting for the right opportunity to infuse the language, infuse the uh, commitment, and a governor who is willing to take on the charge for children. I want to thank uh, the speakers again and thank the audience for their interest and attention. We'll see you in four weeks and a round of applause. Thank you.